Hey everyone and welcome to this week's On the Spot. I'm Zach Strickland, Director of Freight Market Intelligence here at FreightWaves and with me as always is John Paul Hampstead, our Director of Passport Research, JP. Zachary, uh, <laughs> big news this week in yeah. the freight markets. Um, I think th really the, the, the most important theme for us today is just that the outbound tender rejection index has resumed its upward trend. Um, so this is the percentage of loads tendered by shippers that are being rejected by transportation providers for whatever reason. Um, it indicates relative tightness of capacity, right. um, you know, capacity relative to, to demand. And it's up around 25.6 percent. Yeah, today. so it's br it broke back up above 25 percent. Which it had only it had only fallen what to like 24 from 26 correct, percent. Correct. Correct. So it wasn't like the market had loosened tremendously. Yes. We'd just seen this uh, trend shift. Downward. Right. If yeah. if you're a broker, your hair was still on fire. It yeah. was still it's like <laughs> bad things were still happening on a daily basis. Um, but it looked like we might have been you know that might have been fading. Um, we talked about you know, last week or maybe the week before about how this typically happens in September. Normally, September um, ends the month with lower volumes and it begins the month. Uh, that happened in 19, happened in 18. Of course, at the, you know, when we said that, we realized this is like, you know, we're appealing to a pretty weak excuse, right? Like, mm -hmm. like if you're citing normal seasonality in 2020, you've run out of other ideas. Right. <laughs> um, so, you know, knowing knowing that, like, you know, th that probably wasn't the best explanation. Uh, we 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 didn't we didn't think that it was going to be like a permanent downtrend. We didn't think that like the peak was in. We didn't think that now everything's going to return to normal. Right. We we, we thought it would just be like a temporary pause, mm -hmm. and it turns out it was. I mean, there are other reasons why. Like, it's well, not human behavior is very hard to break, especially if you're in a pattern and things have not return to normal, but I think people are trying to get back to that, you know, life, what they knew before 2020. Yeah, and like, even if it's not something inherent about like September itself, that might cause mm -hmm. um, volumes to soften a little bit. There are sort of like waves and cycles mm -hmm. of inventory replenishment. Of Labor Day still happened in 2020. It wasn't like we just ignored Labor Day because it's COVID and everybody's working from home. That still happened. And I think a lot of what we see in September is dependent on Labor Day and that, is a fixture in our society and, and the way that people behave and shippers specifically. Yeah, um, but now we're seeing capacity tightening across the country, uh, most especially in Los Angeles, which again has tenor rejections above 27%, mm -hmm. which is you know just you know, a very high, uh, it's a very difficult market. Especially for the size of a market that it is. Right. I mean, you're, you're not talking about 27% in a Richmond, Virginia. Uh, or something like that. You're talking about a 27% in the nation's largest uh, freight market currently. Yeah, um, and it's had very high tenor rejections for a very long amount of time, which kind of tells me that, like, you know, I mean, I get the fact that, like, capacity is not totally fungible. Mm -hmm. There are different equipment types. There are different um, sort of specializations, different regional networks that kind of lock up capacity. But there is also this sort of over the road, a certain amount of over the road spot capacity that migrates to where uh, the good rates are. Mm -hmm. And the fact that Los Angeles has been so tight for so long and so expensive for so long tells me that like fleets are not able to f sort of satisfy the, the demand there. The overall demand, yeah. yeah. Yeah, it's, it's kind of like we've had, everybody knows Los Angeles has been tight. It's one of the tightest markets in the United States now for the, the last couple of months. And la tightest large market, I should yeah. say. Um, and, you know, it, it once carriers decide, okay, we're trying to get to Los Angeles, they start taking some discounts, getting out there, just so they can take advantage of, you know, the 3X that they're going to make to get back. Um, I think that did stay, that had an impact of stabilizing the market a little bit uh, until all those carriers get out there and then they're now they're on the other side of the country again. That's right, that's a good point. This isn't, you know, this isn't like LA to Las Vegas, LA to Phoenix, LA to Stockton. Um, a lot of the freight coming out of LA on trucks, I have to think is meant to replace intermodal freight, uh, um, you know, that what, where equipment hasn't been available. The rails um, have been very careful about managing their their operating ratios and and their operating margins, right? And only adding crews and power back to their networks on a lag to volumes, right? Right. 
Um, they don't want to get ahead of the volume trend. They want to like be able to let rates run up and just and be super cautious about how they add back cost. Mm -hmm. Well, all that ends up on on trucks. And if you think about intermodal, you're thinking about you know, multi, you know, thousand mile plus moves, right? Right. And so, once the trucks leave LA, they're gone for a while. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah, they're um, not coming back. It's not something. It's not like you can just add two. capacity into this market and make it more liquid until it calms down. Like you're sending trucks in there and then they scatter across the country. And, and the then, West Coast, the least population density. <laughs> you know, if you if you go past the Mississippi River, things spread out a lot more. So you're talking about single day moves between largest the largest cities out there. Whereas out east, you can get you know from Atlanta to Nashville in a day if you need to. Yeah. Yeah, and so um, I think the nature of the demand there, and, and sort of the, you know the, the intermodal bottleneck is is, cre is putting certain kinds of loads into the market there that it's it's hard for carriers to, to manage well. It's it's hard for carriers to um, consistently service that freight because it, it takes their equipment all over the country. Right, and and you know we saw that kind of play out in our tender rejections with Harrisburg tightening rapidly as LA was stabilizing last week. And yep. now that pattern has shifted again where we're seeing Harrisburg uh, you know, fall down a little bit right. uh, in terms of tender rejection rate. And now we're seeing LA tighten back up again. So it's a seesaw battle of where does the, where does the, where do the carriers go uh, to, to keep their freight, uh, to keep their trucks rolling. And you know, we're still seeing a large amount of freight coming into the ports um, and again, you talk about bottlenecks and things like that at the port, so they can only process so much, so many containers. Yeah, that's one interesting out. thing is we've we've seen the data on like the TU volume data come in and, and saw like a record August um, mm -hmm. at um, you know LA and, and, and actually all the West Coast. If you take all the West Coast ports, aggregate them, mm -hmm. that was a record. August was a record month. Um, but like we're not like I don't see that in our customs bills of lading data for LAX. If I type in like CSTM.LAX into Sonar, it looks. I mean, it's obviously it's choppy because of the nature of the ships that come in and right. because of the way that these um, bills of lading are processed in batches. But like, why hasn't that number just like shot up incredibly? Right, and 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 a lot of that has to do with the fact that there is, you know, it's like putting uh, five lanes worth of traffic into two lanes. There's only so much that's gonna come out of it. So we, it looks like, and if you look at our customs data, we, see, we hit that ceiling back in August, and it's just kind of you know, repeatedly hitting that ceiling before it, you know, but the trend is still very high amount of volume coming through the ports. Right, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, it, it's, it's elevated, it's highly elevated on a year-over-year -year basis. It's just not going up to these extremes. And, and you're kind of suggesting that it's because of these inherent um, constraints on essentially people manually processing pieces of paper. There's only so many people, so many pieces of equipment, and there's only so many trucks. And there's obviously the rails, a huge part of the, uh, the port network there. Uh, if they're not taking on anything that's outside of their norm, those containers are just going to pile up and sit. I mean, and you're talking about, you know, people being able to pull those off the right, boats. Right. There's all sorts of processes there that, you know, we're limited by. And again, so almost like the delta between like yeah. the TEUs that we know are getting are hitting the port and the flat line mm -hmm. of bills of lading, like that growing delta we can think of as like port congestion. Exactly. That's really interesting. Yeah, and I, I don't think, I mean, it looks like, again, we've got Golden Week coming up here in, a, in the next week or so. Right. And a lot of these shippers know that, and they're, they've already been thinking, I need to get freight into this country as much as I can. We're looking at uh, Freightos Baltic Exchange uh, rates earlier today, and they're not just the highest all time in like the last several years, but they're, they're like three times as high <laughs> in, in, in some of those yeah. cases. So it's... Yeah. Uh, shippers have drawn, like, have pu pushed these rates much higher due to the fact that the, when you see rates go that much higher than your regular tight moment, like that's basically an indication that shippers are emotional uh, and they're reactive and they're basically trying to get in front of whatever the next 2020 surprise may be. And we have peak season right around the corner. Yeah, peak season's right around the corner. And um, I think we'd be remiss if we didn't bring up inventory levels. I, I know that like when 
we first started seeing some like COVID uh, related inventory to sales ratios, people, were, you know, which plunged, right? right? People were saying like, oh, this is, you know, um, you know, what's going on? Like, like what verticals is being driven by, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and, but we've also seen that data followed up by nominal inventory levels. So the value of inventory in dollars. Right. So apart from sales, um, you know, what, 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 how much stuff is being held by, you know, retailers and, and other kinds of um, businesses in the U.S. And it's at, a, it's at an extremely low level. Right. So that just tells me that, like, there's more restocking, there's more demand ahead of us. Like, I don't think the shippers know yeah, what the American consumer is going to do. Yeah, and it's very different from the pull forward that we saw due to the trade war, where we saw inventory levels creep up higher and higher. We saw the t uh, uh, business inventory to sales ratio go up to 1.4 last year. If, of course, it shot up really rapidly in April this year uh, due right. to the lack of sales and everything in April just shut down, but it, it quickly recovered back down under 1.4. Um, and it's like 1.2 now. Yeah. Like so, so, and again, we look at the uh, LMI, the Logistics Managers Index, which also has an inventory level uh, feature in there, um, which is great for seeing, you know, if an inventory stopped expanding this last month, uh, but capacity still down. So that's an indication. Uh, yeah, capacity continued to tighten at the same time as inventory levels remain flat. So now we're talking about these shippers are, do have us they are seeing enough demand to pull that inventory out of these warehouses and put them you know in consumption like consumption yep. is occurring so it's not simply just a pull forward effect anymore it is a combination of the two things right responding to demand mm -hmm. and trying to anticipate and be prepared for the future which is obviously you know I mean, we talked to 3pls we talked to carriers they ask us like okay like you know, what's consumer demand going to do in six months? <laughs> Which is like, and I'm always like, you know, guys, like if you're talking to your customers and they don't know, like, like no one knows. Yeah, and the, and the shippers, I mean, one of the reasons we look at these customs and these imports, these bookings data is to get a sense of what shippers are forecasting for because they, they normally come into a year, you know, with a budget and a plan to say, we're gonna see X percent sales increase this year over last year. None of them budget for lower sales <laughs> if they, if, you know, if they can help it. So they, they also coordinate with their marketing department. So they'll put out, uh, you know, different items Emotions for and promotional sales. Yeah. sales. So they, they're pretty good at forecasting demand and also because they can create demand with, exactly. with price. So when we see all this, you know, all these, uh, you know, things coming into the United States, that's a good indication that here over the next several months, we're gonna see some increasing demand. Now, right. these people only forecast through the year <laughs> or their season, if you will. Uh, so that means here in December, January, we're gonna see somewhat of a reset. Right, it's, yeah. it's, and, and we'll see different behavior potentially in Q1. Right. That's, that's, that's fascinating too. Um, yeah, I mean, I've noticed just so many uh, void sailings or blank sailings have been reinstated even mm -hmm. during Golden Week um, by, by some lines. And it's just, I mean, to me, it seems like if shippers are, you know, willing to pay far more than normal to mm -hmm. get their freight into the U.S., it's not because they think, oh, we're going to, like, do some sales and, and, and pump, you know, and, and try to, like, pump demand by, like, cutting prices. Like, their costs are going up significantly. And, they've, like, they've doubled and tripled their transportation spend effectively in this short period of time. Now, if you look at the overall spend this year, they're probably still well under budget uh, from that regard. But at the same time, the sales are probably yeah, a little yeah. bit under budget as well. <laughs> right, yeah. I mean, that's, it's wild. Yeah. Like, I... When I hear about like, um, you know, brokerages getting, you know, merging or, mm -hmm. or people buying and selling companies or even like their earnings calls, it's just like there's so much volatility in these earnings. Like no one even, like you, you get a quarterly earnings call for like a truck <laughs> carrier and you're like, is that good? Is that bad? I don't even know anymore. Right. Yeah. A lot of, uh, a lot of mystery here. Uh, so, you know, that'll wrap things up for this week, JP. Thank you as always for joining me here and thank you for watching. Uh, be sure to check us out on freightways.com and any streaming service that you may include. <laughs> so uh, Apple media and all that. And JP, you know, next week it's the end of the month, end of the quarter. We'll probably have some good stuff to yeah, talk about. Yeah. Yeah. It's going to be, that's going to be great.